for I think about half an hour. Professor and head, Dr. Vyas, uh, Vyas Parmar Medical College, uh, Nahan, and he is former professor and head of uh, Indira Gandhi Medical College, Shimla. And I don't know, I can speak volumes about him because I know, <laughs> know him so much. And he is a very sincere, down to earth person with, and a humble person with a great public health vision. He is a great teacher of basics of public health and uh, uh, motivator who will always give his juniors a free hand to work and explore. We at the Department of Community Medicine, Indira Gandhi Medical Sh uh, College, Shimla, will always be indebted to him for his great vision for the growth of Community Medicine Department. A big round of applause for him. <laughs> Our second chair is Dr. D.S. Dadwal, who is uh, Professor in Department of Community Medicine, Indira Gandhi Medical College, Shimla, and who has, who has been working in this department for more than 15 years as a faculty. And he is also graduate and postgraduate of this medical college. He has, been, he has al already worked in WHO NPSP for polio eradication for six years and has been HIV AIDS counseling master trainer in, GF, in GFATM project for seven years. We welcome you, sir. And our third chair is Dr. Anita Thakur. She is associate professor in Department of Community Medicine. And she has served in HP Health Services for uh, 14 years. And then she came into the Department of Community Medicine. And she is here in faculty in Indira Gandhi Medical College, Shimla, for last 10 years. And her research interests include research on prevention of cervical cancer. And she is currently working as PI in cervical cancer training, uh, screening, program, uh, screening project. And is also master trainer of population-based screening in Himachal Pradesh. We welcome you, ma'am. And uh, now I'll hand over the mic to the chairpersons for conducting this session. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Anpam, for good words. And this is a very interesting topic, which that uh, new curriculum for MBBS students given by MCI. And uh, between this topic and us, a known personality is there to speak on the topic. Dr. Pradeep Khanna, senior professor and head of the community medicine, Pandit B.D. Sharma, PGIMS Rohtak. He lives in the hearts of all community medicine members. I do not need to introduce him. And uh, we all know Dr. Pradeep Khanna. I invite him to the dais. And I will read the brief introduction of Dr. Pradeep Khanna that he has uh, academic meets and trainings. He attended 138 conferences, workshops, and training course and CM is till date. And he chaired and moderated 42 scientific sessions during these conferences and workshops. He is a national trainer on infant and young child feeding counseling. He is a national trainer for integrated management of neonatal and childhood illness. And sir, uh, he is also a uh, trainer for uh, served uh, as a facilitator for 33 training courses and workshops. He has received awards in, uh, received Healthcare Excellence Award for uh, teaching uh, excellence in community medicine during Indo-Global Healthcare Summit and Expo 2014 at Hyderabad. And his contribution in training courses and material books, he has uh, uh, <coughs> contributed in training course uh, material on infant and young child feeding counseling and he has written a chapter on epidemiology of glaucoma in first edition of the book entitled principles and practice of glaucoma and his contribution in state level committees he is a member of state level coordination committee of ICDS scheme in Haryana 
and he is a member of advisory committee of anemia control and he is a member of state task force on immunization and child health he is a member of state committee on adverse events following immunization his contribution in research and generals he is a member of national editorial advisory board of indian journal of public health and research and development he is a member of advisory board of indian journal of community medicine and contributed 121 such papers so it is uh, his uh, brief cv and uh, now i request uh, dr pradeep khanna to deliver his uh, topic thank you dr majda well greetings from haryana for all of you sitting in the audience learned chairperson and uh, the learned audience well i can see many faces who are possibly as experienced or maybe more experienced than what i am in the field of community medicine but the conference organizers were kind enough to give me the assignment of sharing the competency based undergraduate medical <laughs> curriculum in india so let's see how it will <clears> out <throat> now where is the need for the change maybe if you can recall one of my colleagues sitting in the audience right now professor goel had delivered an oration on this very topic that was on day 1 but this is what is the prescription from the regulations given by medical council of india so regulations on graduate medical education were last notified in the year 1997 and we are sitting in 2019 so the felt need for adapting these regulations to the changing demographic socio economic context perceptions values and expectations of stakeholders you will agree with me that change is the only thing which is constant and change is always for better things to happen and there are always challenges when any change is implemented there are always you know hiccups which should be taken as opportunities for us to work on those challenges now if you see what was there in 97 regulations and what is there in the latest document the comparison would bring it out that the 2018 regulations have virtually evolved from the basic principles which were enshrined in the regulations of 1997 and i'm sure all my colleagues from the community medicine discipline know them all and i am sure they are well conversant with this document which is very much available on the website of the medical council of india see now the basic philosophy with which these regulations are being brought in is the ability to recognize health for all you know even long back we said health for all by 2000 but the vision was not you know gone through the way we desired it to happen so it the curriculum has been updated keeping in consonance the changing health needs of the country you know the lifestyles keep on changing the time i was born the diets keep on changing and the gadgets keeps on changing so the health profile and the disease profile also keep on changing you know from the communicable uh, diseases era we move into the ncds and now we talk a lot of ncds uh, when i was born there was nothing like a junk food uh, now there are so many foods available i never uh, could dream of uh, having a gadget in my phone, you know pocket where could i could deliver letters to any place mails to any place and my pictures to any place maybe before i go out of this hall i can put my pick immediately on that so these gadgets also affect our health in one way or the other so this is the changing disease profile the lifestyle modifications which necessitate always the you know uh, desirable changes in the health system to meet these and if the health system has to change the medical education has to change so that's the philosophy so we wish to ability to recognize health for all should exist with all of us now they labeled as you know law of experts went into deliberations and prepared this document and one thing which they said was it is a outcome based strategy highly committed medical professionals have contributed in developing the document incorporating appropriate teaching learning strategies you will understand that once we change something maybe the teaching methodology has to undergo a change the tools and techniques 
of teaching have to change and if the teaching modules teaching tools change so we have a need to change the methods of assessment also because assessment is directly related to the way we impart our teaching i mean in our times when i was doing my medical school there were nothing uh, called a mcq and these days much of the things are oriented around um, you know multiple choice questions now there is a whole lot of encouragement to integrated teaching i think over the last uh, few decades we all teachers have been deliberating on integrated teaching but possibly we didn't encounter that kind of a success which we dreamt of here and maximum efforts have been made to encourage integrated teaching between traditional subject areas using pbl problem based learning that's a very 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 healthy kind of an approach pbl and we do it in our department at least with our postgraduate students starting with a clinical or a community case and exploring the relevance of various preclinical disciplines and understanding and resolution of the problem i can assure you if there are problems there are always solutions i i believe in the dictum when i was a child i used to read where there is a will there is a way and i say where there is a will there are more than one ways available the only thing is you have the intent to counter it to face it and to explore further now they want to deemphasize compartmentalization very sincere efforts have been made to deemphasize compartmentalization of disciplines so as to achieve both horizontal and vertical integration in different places when as a student i used to be taught on tuberculosis i used to wonder how many departments talk of tuberculosis so that used to you know strike me as a young boy at that time in my early 70s that why tuberculosis is not taught by a panel of an experts of all the subjects who teach me tuberculosis and that in you know community medicine is one subject which i believe and i am not saying so because i come from community medicine it is attached intimately with all other disciplines there cannot be a discipline which doesn't need the prevention so we are a part of virtually all other discipline which are start during under graduation or maybe in post graduation now this is something which has been given special attention in short they have labeled it as atcom sir attitude ethics and communication i strongly believe that communication has to be the strong weapon of any medico you know words the way they are spoken are sometimes more important than the content we indulge in so ethical values responsiveness to patients needs and acquisition of communicable skills is under, underscored by providing dedicated curriculum in the form of longitudinal program based on attitude ethics and community com competences and this has been labeled as atcom and this is available with this latest curriculum now they say this is one big example of interdisciplinary teamwork you know nothing team stands for together everyone achieves more if you take the first letter of the word team together e everyone a achieves m more you know when we lose matches we talk of team that the team work was excellent team spirit was excellent if we lose a match we criticize the team spirit and the team work so it's always a team and medical profession is definitely a team work so great emphasis has been placed on collaborative interdisciplinary team work and professionalism with due sensitivity to differences in thought social and economic position and gender there is something called foundation course imbibed in it an attempt has been made to allow students from diverse educational streams and backgrounds to transition appropriately through a foundation course dedicated time has been allotted for self directed learning and co curricular activities i can assure you if you wish to learn something i give my own example to my friends that i learned driving by observing my drivers who were driving the vehicles uh, this is the way he pedals the clutch this is the way he pedals the brake this is the way he looks after the steering and slowly and steadily i started developing a confidence and one of my chair persons he was also referring to this yesterday that his doctor learned the driving art sitting next to him as a conductor you know 
most important is if there is a self direction in learning process you can take a horse to a pond you can never force it drink water we have to make sure that i want to learn this and students have to have this kind of a philosophy in their minds and i think even for co curricular activities this is most important then what about curricular governance and support formative and internal assessments have been streamlined to achieve the objectives of the curriculum you know in national boards we do talk of formative assessments some of my colleagues must have done it it's very essential that whatever the students do we get back to them what they have done and give them ample opportunity to improve on their performance they have a right to know why they fared poor why they have been scored poorly and how can they improve that is what is basically the essence of formative assessments curricular governance and support have been strengthened increasing the involvement of curriculum committees and medical education units in various medical colleges as per the prescription of medical council of india all the medical schools where are, i think we have more than 450 plus am i right dr goel we have more than 450 colleges in our country and uh, i always say india is not a country we are a country having so many countries we you know um, 130 plus crores of population virtually holding on to one sixth of the globe so once we talk of country we talk of one sixth of the globe as a kind of a thing you know nearly 17 percent of the population resides in this magnificent land of ours so all the medical colleges are supposed to have mandatorily a medical education unit and in fact there are some colleges where people have opted full time working into the medical education unit i myself served for 6 years as coordinator of the medical education unit where the teachers are trained on the latest technologies in medical education and the curriculum committee has a very important role you cannot continue with the curriculum which was designed 20 years back it has to keep pace with the changing needs of the community now what are the qualities which are being anticipated in now we start calling as indian medical graduate we expect that he would be a clinician of the desired excellence then he is to be a communicator there are many people who have lot of knowledge maybe because of lack of communication skills they fail to pass on what they know and there are gentlemen and ladies who maybe know half of them but they transmit all whatever they know to the audience that's the art of a communicator and we expect a doctor to be a wonderful communicator you know you have to have healing words you have to have some kind of uh, a touch in your voice which makes the patient feels okay i am bothered about the welfare of the patient you have to talk to the attendants of the patient they must feel that they have been dealt with very fairly then team leader sitting at any health institution the doctor is expected to play the role of team leader he has to be the captain of the team basically you know starting from the sub central level going up to the tertiary hospitals we have various roles where we are expected to be talking in terms of a team leader then we have to integrate things integrate this with different departments health is a entity which cannot be developed by the health sector alone we have to have intersectoral coordination and for them you have to have a feeling of integrating with others then professional lifelong learner i don't think there can be a better example than medical education where you have to be a lifelong learner learning never stops the moment you think i am okay with everything i know the decline starts that's thank you very much i believe we learn every time we consult uh, you know connect with a patient or an attendant then collaborate the collaborations are with different departments different ministries now what are the national goals which have been enshrined in this document at the end of the undergraduate program the indian medical graduate should be able to recognize health for all as a national goal and health right of all citizens and by undergoing training for medical profession fulfill his or her social obligations towards realization of this goal when we joined school we were labeled as next to god i mean i am sure i was motivated to become a doctor simply because people used to say doctor to bhagwan hai 
we were certainly labeled as next to God. So this is a profession wherein we are supposed to give health to the people. Nobody else, once a patient goes, it goes. A machine goes wrong, we can get it rectified. But the human life lost cannot be brought back. Learn every aspect of national policies on health and devote herself to its practical implementation. I mean, there cannot be a better example of implementation of national health programs than our Department of Community Medicine. All of my colleagues, through their departments, lend their expertise and lend a lot of support in running up all the policies and national health programs. The medical graduate should be able to achieve competence and practice of holistic medicine, encompassing promoter, preventive, promoter, curative, and rehabilitative aspects of common diseases. Develop scientific temper. This is an era of evidence-based medicine. Nobody will take your statement without any evidence. We have moved into that era. So I am talking of scientific temper, acquire educational experience for proficiency in profession, and promote healthy living. Become an exemplary citizen by observing medical ethics. Now, a lot of uh, human cries raised about our deeds and misdeeds. I believe people see still medical profession as the noblest profession. Despite whatever is being said these days on many platforms, I still feel proud to be a doctor. And I feel proud of my profession. You know, you have to make sure that we stick to medical ethics the way, you know, when, what I feel is I should be uh, delivering that kind of care to a person when I go to my colleagues as a patient. I believe I have all sorts of queries to be answered by my physician friends that what should I be doing, what should be the precautions, and I don't mind how much time I am taking. So we must be a listener when somebody comes to us and we are in the role of a physician. Then fulfilling social and professional obligations so as to respond to the national aspirations. Health is a citizen's right, basically. Yesterday, somebody was talking of, uh, you know, how much of the per capita GDP we spend on the health care, which is quite low in our country. But I can assure you, if you do your best, even with limited resources, we can do wonders. Now, there are certain institutional goals associated with this new curriculum. The Indian medical graduates coming out of a medical institute should be competent in diagnosis and management of common health problems of the individual and the community. You know, we have two kinds of physicians, like we all known as community physicians, because we by and large work at the level of the community, not at the level of the individual. Hospitals, they work at the level of, in their OPDs, at the level of the individuals. So we need to make sure that we know the problems of an individual as well as the community. Commensurate with has her position as a member of the health team of the primary, secondary and tertiary levels. You know, we have a network of primary health centers, community health centers, sub-health centers, and then move up divisional hospitals, then move up tertiary, you know, medical schools like the one we are right now here. So we have to feel that what is my role? The role of a medical officer at PHC would be different, at CSA would be different, and at a divisional level would be different. And it will be most of the time the expertise, the trainer part at the level of the tertiary hospital, like we are at IGMC Shimba right now. So clinical skills based on history, physical examination, relevant investigations. I know there used to be a full uh, volume which used to talk of examination of patients. Our teachers used to you always say, listen to the patient and give a thorough physical examination. That is most important skill to be learned. Then the graduate should be competent to practice preventive, promotive, curative, and independent medicine in respect to the commonly encountered health problems. You know, sometimes what happens, we keep on talking of uncommon problems in comparison to the common problems. Common problems first. Appreciate rational for different therapeutic modalities. Be familiar with the administration of the essential drugs and their common side effects. We got to know which is the list of essential medicines and what are the effects of, uh, uh, including the side effects. He or she should be able to appreciate the socio-psychological, cultural, economic, and environmental factors affecting health and development. See, the point is cultural barriers play a lot of you know, role in determining the health status of the community. If we talk of a basic thing like breastfeeding, the community barriers are there to be encountered. 
and economy i i feel no country can afford full free treatment of all the diseases of full population you know somewhere economy plays a big part and there is always a debate whether health is a purchasable commodity or not but we feel we should be able to appreciate the socio psychological cultural economic and environmental factors affecting health and develop humane attitude towards the patients in discharging professional responsibilities we must possess the attitude for continued self learning and to seek further expertise or to pursue research in any chosen area of medicine action research and documentation skills you know these workshops training courses conferences one of the main aim and theme is exchange of information and we learn from each other may you know somewhat enrich the knowledge of some colleagues of yours and in turn get enriched in some aspects of your own knowledge so that kind of exposure must be available with the indian medical graduate the indian medical graduate may be familiar with the basic factors which are essential for the implementation of national health programs including practical aspects of family welfare and maternal and child health sanitation and water supply prevention and control of communicable and non communicable diseases immunization health education indian public health standards at various level of service delivery biomedical waste disposal organizational and institutional arrangements it's not only the theory part i am saying he or she should be well equipped with the practical application of all these things because if i know theory and i am not able to apply it in the field situations which is essential for the community the theory knowledge will go waste i must know how to replicate into exact field situations and for that the need is that they should be well equipped with the skills to put their knowledge of theory into practical skills we expect the medical graduate acquires basic management skills in the area of human resources now management is a whole lot of subject altogether you know there are a lot of uh, things which are said about management uh, if something goes wrong we immediately pinpoint uh, the management was not okay so the management skills uh, in fact there is a module for the medical officers which was brought out long back by national institute of health and family welfare which talks of management itself then materials and resource management related to healthcare delivery general and hospital management principal inventory skills and counseling we must know what to have with us what not to have with us the medical graduate should be able to identify community health problems and learn to work to resolve these by designing instituting corrective steps and evaluating outcome of such measures sometimes we may put a solution which may not work okay we must have an alternative solution in mind if this didn't work believe me that experiments if they fail even that's a lesson for us you don't always start with an experiment thinking is to be a success all the time a medical graduate be able to work as a leading partner in healthcare teams and acquire proficiency in communication skills which i already spoken of be competent to work in a variety of healthcare settings if i am posted in one college i am posted in another college i am posted in third college or i am posted anywhere at the state headquarters i am looking after a program i should be able to deliver my best in all the settings not that i cannot the work should be i can and so the medical graduate should be able to work in the variety of settings and some of you have you know varied experience of working in different uh, you know states of the country with maybe having different cultural backgrounds also then have personal characteristics and attitudes required for professional life including personal integrity sense of responsibility and dependability and ability to relate or show concern for other individuals we should be looked upon as somebody okay who's bothered genuinely about the health of the client who's coming to us that's the kind of philosophy of the medical profession now what is holistic care we always talk preventive promotive curative palliative and holistic care you know why should it come to curative and why does it come to curative because preventive is not given the emphasis it deserves how many of us go for annual checkups of our own i am talking of myself it includes me 
how many of us go for our regular dental checkups i am talking of us including my own so you know there is not that stress on preventive medicine which is deserves so that is why more and more need of curative services and rehabilitative palliative arrives then communicate with patients respecting patients values that's very important when you talk to somebody I always give an example that if somebody seeks your advice uh, what happens that most of us uh, that includes me i am not an exception somebody talks of me i become an advocate somebody talks of another person i become a judge straight away don't judge others immediately somebody asks for your advice say if i were in your shoes i would have done it like this so that would not hurt the other person don't pass a judgment that he was wrong so you have to respect patient's values the patient comes and says i took this i took this okay fine 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 don't try to tell him you don't know anything don't try to frighten up by saying that you have been doing wrong listen to him and then say okay now let me listen to me but give him a patient listening their values beliefs preferences and most importantly the privacy has to be maintained and the medical graduate has to be trained like this uh, my friends who are physicians never talk about their patients to me unless and until that's from my family and i i enjoy that that they keep confidentiality about the patients they treat now what are the thrust in new regulations one is that medical education is now being expected to be more learner centric teacher should not be teaching what the teacher wants to teach it should be shaped around needs of the audience and that is a medical student we should only teach those things which are meant for him or her then patient centric the treatment modalities whether it is uh, tertiary or uh, secondary or primary level has to be based around what is the problem of the patient it has to be gen- gen- sorry gender sensitive outcome oriented and environment appropriate these are the thrust in new education regulations now what can be the and what are as we perceive the major changes one is change in duration of phases i think this point was brought out by my colleague in his oration two days before foundation course has been added and there is a you know well thought change regarding early clinical exposure at com which i refer to earlier as attitude ethics and communication these are the major changes which have been envisaged in the new regulations they are outcome driven a significant attempt has been made on the outcome driven undergraduate curriculum to provide orientation and impart skills necessary for lifelong learning to enable proper patient care in particular the curriculum provides early clinical exposure electives and longitudinal care now that's very important skill acquisition skill acquisition you will all believe is an indispensable component of the learning process in medicine i mean even examination is a skill auscultation is a skill you talk of anything procedure it's a skill the curriculum reinforces this aspect by necessitating certification of certain essential skills a particular number of certifications have to be done for each and every component the experts have factored in patient availability access consent you can't draw my sample blood sample without obtaining a valid informed consent these days number of students in a class in suggesting skill acquisition and assessment methods you have to make sure we talk of you know a particular thing and uh, i i'll come to that what are the modalities of teaching nowadays we are you know familiar with what are skill labs and simulated environments use of skill labs simulated and guided environments have been encouraged in the pre internship years the highest level of skill acquisition is a show ho uh, you know we'll come to some words show show how know know how in a simulated or guiding environment few skills require independent performance and certification opportunity to perform these skills will be available during internship you know we don't let our medical graduates even give injections 
I know when I was in third year, I went to my hometown and somebody expected that I am a doctor. The moment you enter the first prof, they say you are a doctor and they wanted me to give an injection. I, I said, sorry, but I felt it that I am a third year student and I am doing clinical. Still, I don't know how to give an injection. So, you know, we say that they will be available during internship. Then there is a full module on attitude, ethics and communication. Students need to be trained effectively to communicate with patients and their relatives in a manner respecting their preferences, values, beliefs, confidentiality and privacy. You know, unless and until this is done, you may have wonderful ideas in your mind, but unless and until you are able to communicate and talk to people, the talking doesn't happen. It's very easy sitting up there. It's very difficult coming up here. I always admire those students who have guts to come and do this kind of volunteership. Okay, okay I'll do the you know, demo to the patient. A module on the ta attitude, ethics, and communication was prepared by the Medical Council of India, and the teaching faculty of Medical College have been trained have been receiving training on this module since 2015. You know, training is a very important part. I think this point was uh, raised in his oration by Dr. Goel, that if you wish to make a change in any, you know, long-standing kind of curriculum, you have no choice but to train your youngsters or the coming faculty or even the oldies like me to the changes you are expecting. And uh, trainings can never end even at the fag end of your careers. They are a must. Train and then cascade training downstairs. You have to have a model of inbuilt training. Now, what is the basic kind of uh, touch which there should be in communication? You have to be respectful. You have to be non-threatening. And I, as I said earlier also, you have to be non-judgmental and empathetic manner. You know, the patient should feel I'm, you know, trying to realize the problem the patient is going through. That is empathy. We have to show these qualities. These are very important bedside skills. I always say to my students that if you want to be a good orator, first try to be a good listener. That's very important. Generally what happens when somebody talks to us, we said we had enough of it. When we start talking, we say we hardly heard it. We just started the discussion. And I will use the word, very few words I have shared with you. So you've got to be a very, very patient listener. Then verbal communication and non-verbal communication. I tell my colleagues not to be indulging with the gadget called cell phone when you are listening to people. Not to take calls when you are listening to patients. Don't say them, I am listening through one ear. The other ear is busy. Attention cannot be paid to two things at a right time. I can assure you. You have to make non-verbal communication. Your gestures, your facial expressions, your body language has to inspire confidence in the patient and their attendance. Okay, right now I am only bothered about your sickness or your health. Then creating respect in patients' encounters. They go out, they must talk very nicely of us. Okay, this doctor is a gentleman. I can assure you, clinical skills come much later. The communication skills come first of all. Your first impression is the last impression we have been he hearing since I was a child. So the moment you talk to him, he or she, the patient, will make an impression of yours. Your communication skills matter the most. In fact, sometimes more than what your clinical skills may be. Now, how do you plan these things? Introductory large group sessions then self-directed guiding learning, small group sessions, simulations, multitasking. Kindly avoid these things, lack of eye contact. Always have an eye contact with the client you are talking. I'm sure it leaves a lot of effect once you see eye to eye with your client. That's very important. And don't interrupt the patient. There is a concept called guiding the interview. Sometimes you ask a particular thing and the person goes on, goes on, goes on. Even then interrupt, okay, you have said so much and that's all right. Now maybe come to this and have your response on this. This is called guiding the interview. Don't ever interrupt and saying, say, okay, enough of it here. Yeah. Now come to this point. Don't say this. This hurts. They are not as educated as we are. So we must learn how to interrupt them politely and bring them to the path we want to have them. 
then these are the domains I was talking. The medical graduate has to understand. There are certain domains, subjects where he has to know. Then there are certain subjects and topics where it applies knows how. Then there are certain subjects where it works as shows. Uh, certain subjects where it shows how. And there are then finally performs independently. You know, if you will look into the website of Medical Council of India, a whole lot of document is there. For all of us, anybody can, uh, you know, see that the way I saw it. And the words will be written like K, K, H, S, S, H, and P. Certain skills are needed. We must be able to, you know, impart education in a way that the medical graduate is able to enumerate, describe, observe, demonstrate, and assist, and finally perform independently. Now, these are the suggested teaching learning methods. One is lecture, which is dialectic lectures. We call it popularly theory lectures. Then a small group discussions, um, they become more meaningful. You know, in a medical school which has a you know, student strength of 200, the effectivity of uh, lectures sometimes comes under a cloud. And I see my colleague Mohan Dovle nodding his head that it's not easy to be speaking to 200 and catching the attention of all of them. So small group discussions, they have a role. Then, you know, uh, in our community uh, medicine teaching, we take our undergraduates to hospitals and various hospitals. We show them how a sub-center functions. We show them how a primary health center functions. In their field visits, we show them how a CSC functions, how a divisional hospital functions. Obviously, in our own hospital, we take them to many places like immunization clinic. And we show them even the civil surgeon's office to let them know a feel of the administrative uh, kind of problems they are likely to encounter when they become medical officers. Then bedside clinics. Bedside teaching is very important. Patient is live there. They can elicit the signs and symptoms under the guidance of a senior person. Then debates. They must be encouraged to talk. They must be encouraged to talk. Never stop a person from asking questions. Never stop them. If you don't have an answer, be honest. We'll come back to you tomorrow. There may be instances when we don't know the answers. We cannot be the end all of all information on one subject. Then DOAP sessions is popularly called it. it. It goes as demonstrate, observe, assess, and perform. And this is a very valid kind of teaching and learning method. Then assessment methods. One since time immemorial, we have been writing our papers, and they are evaluated. Written, what transparency of assessment is. Now we have fictitious roll numbers pointed out in the theory papers at most of the places. So we don't know whose paper it is being evaluated. Then VIVA. VIVA should always start from easier things and go on to the difficult ones. Never start with the most complicated things. Then skill assessment does something. You know, we ask the students to make slides. That's a skill assessment. We ask them to give injectable. It's an assessment. Fine. And even, you know, demonstration for a contraception, I call it as a skill because communication skill is being used. Then short notes. We have essay type questions also. We have short notes also. These days, there are certain universities which have incorporated even one-liners in their question answers. Then documentation. This is very important. Logbook. Practical logbook must be there with all undergraduates. Whatever practicals they have done, they have to make a sincere and honest record of this. And then observation by the faculty. Unless and until we keep on observing our students meticulously, it's not easy to ensure their fullest participation. Teacher taught must have kind of a combine that, okay, this is what we plan, and the lesson plan should be done in consultation with the students. Now, final part of the, you know, is that what they have talked about, integration of subjects. Alignment and integration of subjects, both vertically and horizontally, while respecting the necessity and strength of subject-based instruction and assessment. This is not very easy to be doing, as it takes for me to be speaking. Now, the example is, I'm talking of community medicine because we are sitting in a national conference of the preventive and social medicine. Health hazards of air, water, and noise pollution, when we talk in community medicine, we need a physician's help to be enlarging the way Medical Council of India now envisages under the new regulations. 
waterborne diseases, nutrition, basic stats and its applications. These are some examples where I've cited one department that we need to you know, take on board the people from medicine department. Similarly, with epidemiology, communicable and non-communicable diseases, geriatric services, disaster management, we need our colleague faculty from the Department of Medicine to be on board with us. If we talk of pediatrics, waterborne diseases, nutrition, again basic stats and applications, communicable and non-communicable, but add one more as reproductive maternal and child health. You know, if we talk of basic maternal and child health care, only three departments are involved. Uh, that is Ops and Gynae, Pediatrics, and Community Medicine. So Pediatrics also has a big role when we talk of Community Medicine. Ops and Gynae, Demography and Vital Statistics, Reproductive, Maternal, and Child Health. We need to have their support with us when we talk on these subjects. Now, what are the subjects vis a vis Community Medicine expected to go and help them? Community medicine shall have to integrate with physiology, you know, biochemistry, pathology, microbiology, pharmacology, forensic medicine, toxicology, dermatology, venerology, leprosy, ophthalmology, psychiatry, general medicine, obzangani, pediatrics, general surgery, respiratory medicine. Can you see any other department where the role of community medicine is not anticipated? Somebody wants to talk of a contraceptive in physiology, they'll call us. So we have, in fact, uh, vis -a vis uh, our other way role is more important. We have to contribute in a big way. Sometimes I share with my colleagues that we should be merged. One of my faculty is sitting here. I tell them we should be deputed to other departments, all of us, including me. And we should go and play our role there effectively because the clinician may not be having enough time to be talking of prevention and what, what else we do in community medicine. So I come to the last slide. Summing up the manual on competency based undergraduate curriculum for the Indian medical graduate is intended for curriculum planners and an institution to design learning and assessment experiences for the MBBS student. Now that's not an easy call. That's what my worthy learned colleague Goel was talking the day before. I, I think on the first day you were trying to raise these points. But I always feel and I have a considered opinion, and I have a right to my opinion, that, okay, given the will, anything can be done. We have seen changes which were just not thought of, which was not dreamt of, but they happened. Same way I strongly believe that it is a challenge. Of course, I do, do, do ditto my colleague. It's a challenge for all of us to sit over there you know, we have a curriculum committee in all the medical colleges. But it is for the faculty like you and me to sit and accept this challenge and make our own design. How are we going to implement it? You will agree with me, not all the medical schools have a uniform way of teaching. Every institution has a certain good, very good points of their own and maybe lacking in some points. We keep on going to you know, various uh, institutions, we visit each other as assessors also. We find certain very strong points which we'd love to assimilate into our teaching curriculum also. So content have been curated to provide guidance for the curriculum planners, leaders and teachers in medical schools. What I was discussing with some of my colleagues when we had a meeting regarding this very medical education in our dean's office, I said, okay, we say the experts, eminent experts have contributed. The ex eminent experts are like you and me. They are also human beings. Okay, they are like palm steering. Maybe from a profession which is close to the health needs. So they must be used with reference to and in the context of the revolution, uh, regulations. So I will end up saying that, that uh, I again reiterate that I am one amongst you, like other colleagues of yours, but I had the, uh, say, I'll say, honor of being given this assignment of discussing and putting it before you because this is the prescription of Medical Council of India, which we have to accept, which we have to implement, if I understand correctly, from this 19 admissions itself, so which will happen any time uh, in the second half of the year. So we have to prepare ourselves to change ourselves to the needs of this so I say thank you for the patient listening and have a nice day ahead. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Krishna. Uh, you made these all MCI modules uh, in one session, and you summarized them nicely. And I hope that there will be many questions, and it is open for discussion. And kindly introduce yourself with your institution, and then the question or the suggestion, whatever is. Please. So, thank you for the excellent presentation. What you said, it has to happen, and it's good what is happening. And it's challenging. But uh, if you have to start by 19, we had a discussion of this kind. I'm from I'm Dr. Amit from Goa Medical College. Mm. And we had a discussion at our college and it was quite chaotic because each one interprets this differently, especially the integration part of it. Mm -hmm. So one way of starting, if you want to start it at 19, prepare a timetable. Now we have a fixed timetable, communicable disease, one semester, something else, some other semester. Prepare a timetable for first year, second year, third year. One model timetable that anyone in any college has worked. Send it and then we can it's easier for us to understand how much of integration has to be. So if you have to go and teach contraceptives with physiology, teach contraceptives with gynecology, and then I don't know with, with whom, it will be little, there's a lot of repetitiveness. So that's one thing. Two, we will confuse the students. Our textbooks are designed for the old curriculum. Now the new curriculum will probably require a new textbook or else the ambiguity will confuse the students. And I don't know, in our attempt to make things more interesting, which it is, we may, we may make the students read so many textbooks, they'll have to read PSM and physiology and I don't know what. So it may become a little confusing. One uh, model that we can use, network, is the National Medical College Network where all the colleges, some colleges are networked uh, through telemedicine. So to bring about this uniformity and a uniform understanding, we can use that uh, platform to do that. And it has to be done fast because I tell you from my side, there is confusion. We want to do it, but we don't know how to do it. Thank you. See, as I said to you in my earlier words, that I am also one like you. But we will sit there and find out the solutions. It takes time. You know, change always sinks in after a little bit of time. We have learned faculty at most of the medical colleges in our country. And I'm sure if they meaningfully sit together with an intention to find out a way, the way will come out. You know, we interact many times. We take the students in our department to pediatrics department to gynecology department. Uh, you have to have a personal rapport with the chiefs of the other departments to make integrated teaching happen. It doesn't, hap it doesn't happen most of the times because we have never, you know, strongly will to do it. I'm not a defendant of this because this is not being produced by me. This has been produced by Medical Council of India and I will be as much a user of this like you. But I, I find Books are the same. I mean, even I read th so many books which are not from community medicine. Sometimes we talk of family medicine, so I have to read books which are not essentially community medicine books. You know, I, I have to read for hospital administration, which may not be essentially a book on uh, community medicine per se. So books will remain the same. It's only how we, you know, can put it together. And uh, I always say that books are your best teachers and teachers are best at making them clear to the students. We make the comprehension much more accessible to the students. So that is why teachers are required. Otherwise, everybody can read the book. So that's our art and challenge, how we will assimilate it. I do accept, and this is what I said, my friend said, it's a challenge. But you've got to go ahead with it. And every institution will have to have, you cannot have a one, one carat for every con the, you know, state and every college. It cannot be. We failed to form a uniform name for our own subject for so long. Imagine, it was preventable social medicine, it was social and preventive medicine, it was community medicine, and it is somewhere it is a center for community medicine. So finally we could come to community medicine after so many years, despite uh, that still we have an Indian Association of Preventive and Social Medicine. So it takes time and everything, but patient space, I'm sure if there is a will, that should be doable, in my, my opinion. I, I, I stand to, you know, corrections and your judgments, but I personally feel it's doable. Yeah, please. Uh, I said Dr. Suryavanshi, Professor and Head of Community Medicine, Kokurala National Medical College in Nairobi, New York. Uh, thank you for this comprehensive presentation, sir. But if you see the... But if you see the initial documents of MCA on the undergraduate medical education in India, more or less the contents are same. So yep. I feel it is old wine in new bottle. Yep. But changing the title doesn't change the contents of the bottle. Now, so many years we are having the same contents that we have failed. 
Now, by changing the title, are you sure, sir, really will be going ahead? Because every time what is observed, that is a old wine in new bottle. Because if you see the contents, same, same old, if you say the document, it is same. Sir, I like that. Uh, see, yeah. Yeah. that's what I, I feel. Because uh, number yeah, of. Uh, yeah. the, chair, uh, uh, the thing is that if you, yeah. if you look at this uh, presentation, you will see that they have not emphasized more on uh, changing the curriculum uh, of uh, I mean the book book part, theoretical part. It is more about application part. The application is more about synergizing, integrating, and increasing your communicable skills and integrating with different departments. So that uh, in that context, the ball is in our court, uh, in, the, in, in the hands of the faculty of the medical colleges, how we are able to integrate and imbibe this. So this does not uh, uh, require so much of changing the textbooks or the academic part of it. It, it requires more of how you communicate mm -hmm. better with the students with different methodologies. We have to change uh, uh, from the old lecture-based methodology to more integrated self-learning modules. Sir, as far as evaluation and assessment of medical graduates is concerned, it is clearly mentioned that it should be on three domains. Cognitive domain, psychometer domain, and affective domain, which inputs all the things, skills, practical skills, theoretical knowledge, communication skills, everything is mentioned, very elaborate in the previous document. So, but we have to be, so, we have to be self-introspective as faculty also. Are we, do, were we doing that kind of a methodology in undergraduate uh, curriculum? Basically, most of the medical colleges were doing more of one way imparting of knowledge by lecture method. So, we have to invite more and more involving the students into it. I think the learner chair has made a valid point. And coming to you, yeah, yeah, they, they themselves agree that the principles, basic principles of 97 regulations, they are still there. And it has all evolved from those principles only. The soul is still there. Ah, you want to go See, the contents of the syllabus, the topics, are going to be much more what were there in the past. There are new origins of knowledge coming up. The challenges are changing. As he rightly pointed out, cultural, economic, and our policy is going to be inculcated and to be addressed in our syllabus. See, ultimate aim of our uh, graduate is to fulfill the demands of the society. Yeah. Changing health needs in the future. We have to shape the product as per the demand of the consumers. Our society consumer, we are providers. Sir, our product should be sustainable in the changing environment and the demands of the society. Therefore, in the past, we were more knowledge based. Now, we are going to have the skill. I have an ample of knowledge, but I don't have to practice. I don't have the skill to practice. I don't understand where to practice. I don't understand to what extent it is to be practiced. These skills to be developed as per the need of the students yes. in the context of the demands of health of the society. That is the main objective in this revised curriculum. And we have the competencies to be developed, yes. to be practiced, and the skills to be assessed. That is the thing in the revised curriculum. Now challenge is with us, all of you will agree, that we are going to have the competency-based syllabus and changing methods of training. Thank you for tonight's question. I would like to just give a ah, comment. Dr. I'm Dr. Goyal, yes. uh, professor in head department of committee medicine. And uh, I will answer to the person who was asking about the integration. Now, you must be knowing that it is written very clearly that integration is not teaching many faculty in one class. It's when you are making a lesson plan there at that level, you have to involve everyone. So that's the one thing. So if you involve that person in your field, maybe from the attic department or maybe from medicine department, involve that while you are preparing the lesson plan itself. If you are not involving, then you have to involve everybody else. So that's the one thing that we have to do. It is, it is there. It is, it's there in document, and that's why I told this one thing. Second, so coming to the point of yours, this old wine in new bottle, it's not true. True is, we never had a foundation course earlier. Do we have? 
We didn't have the elective postings at earlier. Did we have? We didn't have. Did we? Why the competency has come back now? I, I told you in my oration itself, it's not a one sector which is looking after it. Why, why did it suddenly have come? Why we woke up suddenly that competency has to come? Doctors were earlier, they were doing everything, they were doing fantastic. Why it is now? Have we thought of that? 1978, the WHO has given document. Now, 21 years we are changing our curriculum in place of the, that we were seeing earlier, that we had the same thing. Why we are changing now? There is a need. There are two, thing, two needs are there. One is socio-economic value is changing. Second, we ourselves has gone down. We all doctors. That's why the court cases are coming up. Now, this is not new. This is a political will also, I will tell you. Because last three years, four years, we are getting a lot of attacks on doctors, and they are finding out the issues. There are many studies on this. Why across the, across the country they are finding out? What is there? And that's why they had to bring in this skill-based. Now, the another thing. Do we have, during internship, we were confident enough to give the injections? No. Even today, are we confident to have the vini section? No. Now, small little things, why we are not? We are teaching, we are doing. What we are teaching? You are teaching. But are they learning? The important thing is that. If they are not learning, there is no point of teaching. And that's why it all has come up. I agree with you. These all things are there. I also must end my, I made a comment on my oration that it is not impossible if we want to do it. Ah, yes. That's the important thing. Thank, thank, thank you. you. It, is, it is some new wine in new water. <laughs> <laughs> now you tell. Yes, please. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Then no, no, there is there is one another uh, comment or question, whatever it is. Uh, give. I am Professor Narayan Amar from Bangalore. Uh, Sana has uh, made a very good uh, uh, presentation with regard to early clinical exposure. It is good. It is very much required. But uh, in the hospitals, you know, the in some hospitals, the bed occupancy is very poor. So the clinical students, uh, those who are posted in uh, medicine, they also come. And uh, if we take uh, the our students, uh, then uh, there is not much of encouragement. So there will be some sort of setback. What I feel that is there will be some sort of uh, setback hmm. uh, with the clinical, uh, early clinical exposure. That is one thing. And uh, as far as the... Uh, coordination is required from the clinicians. Uh, it is uh, we are finding very difficult to get the coordination encouragement from the clinicians. Yes. Don't mistake me. Uh, I am in the medical colleges uh, for the past uh, more than three decades. Uh, there is not much of cooperation encouragement from the uh, clinical side, even for the integrated teaching or whatever it is. Doctor, so these are the setbacks. I am talking. Uh, Sessions are good, but these are the setbacks that the what, uh, uh, like me, in the many medical colleges, the professors are facing these problems. Yes. Sir, with due regards and apologies, I strongly feel that if we are on an optimistic mode, this all is doable, like Goel was saying the right now. And uh, I think the word impossible, it says, I am possible. If you split it, it says, I am possible. I, I have a personal opinion of mine as a medical faculty, and I am on the faculty since 1985, that, okay, we can do it. If all of us, uh, we have a collective kind of a commitment to do it, and uh, like Mons was saying that, okay, we all have the competence to put it into practice. That's my take. And I'm, you know, I'm not uh, from the Medical Council of India. <laughs> this is the prescription of Medical Council of India. I'm only conveying what they expect all of us, including me, to be unfolding. Now we are working for our university. Yeah. Okay. Sir, as far as evaluation and assessment of students is concerned, okay, fine. But what about the evaluation and assessment of the teachers, medical teachers? Which you know we have mentioned. See, see, let me, let me no. give it. See, we are, you know, I, as I said, uh, with, sir, just a second, let me answer him. Yeah, as I said earlier, the experts are like you and me. I mean, they are also human beings from the fraternity we belong to. 
we can always put forth suggestions that these should be, you know, there is always, uh, what I say, the mandate of Medical Council of India generally talks of minimum. You can always go beyond those minimum requirements. You can always upgrade what you feel. And in fact, in our university, where two of my faculties are sitting, there was a strong echo of this demand that medical teachers should be assessed by students whom we teach. I should not be grading my officers in their annual confidential reports. It is the student community who should be recording our ACRs. They will agree with me, Dr. Jain and Dr. Varun Arora, that there was once this kind of a movement in my institute, which is now, of course, a constituent college of our health university. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khanna. And this is an unending topic. So we are all teachers, and uh, we are uh, supposed to close it well in time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your input. Okay, okay. Take my it is Dr. Anupam only, if she allows, uh, no problem, but now it is closed. Okay. Eh? Sir, sir, uh, please give mic to, uh, you come, 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 sir, come, sir, come, sir. Come, sir. Wherever the, the, the competency-based medical education, ethics, attitude, communication, all these things should be incorporated. So there are more than 300 medical colleges. So we can't. So it is not be uh, wise to go on for doing a syllabus, right? Preparing a syllabus in each medical college. I urge upon the IAPSM to form a curriculum committee so that. We can go for a syllabus, common syllabus, and basing on which slight changes can be made in the medical colleges accordingly. So this is my suggestion. It will be very easier. Thank you, sir. Good suggestion. Thank you, sir. OK, as we come to close of this session, I thank all the speaker, Dr. Pradeep Khanna, and all the chairpersons for such an informative session. And I would like to congratulate all the delegates and participants who have really participated in Majta to please hand over the token of appreciation to Dr. Pradeep Khanna. He is professor and head PJMS Rotak and a very learned person. May I request Dr. Goyal to please felicitate Dr. S.R. Majta, our chairperson. So please stay on the stage for photograph. May I request now, now request Dr. Mohan Doyabele to please felicitate Dr. D.S. Dadwal. I request Dr. R Dr. Rashmi Kundapur to please felicitate Dr. Anita Thakur. Please hold the <laughs> memento, Rashmi. <laughs>
now we close the current session and i request all the participants to please go to audi auditorium for, for uh, other sessions thank you